to welcome you today. I'm pinch hitting for Greg because he had to move away for some, some things. Um, we're not sure he'll be back for the second service, but he's going to minister to, to some people in need. And I'm really proud of him for doing that. I think that that's one of the qualities I see in this man. But that puts me up here pinch hitting. So um, when it comes to leading the service, I always feel like, you know, like he's Babe Ruth and, and I'm gonna come up and take his place hitting. And so uh, we're just, we're just gonna thank our God that he's here with us, that he, he's come to, our, to this moment in time. You know, we set appointments like this. Like, it always amazes me. We set a service like this and we're saying, we're gonna meet together at nine o'clock. And the expectation is the God of the universe goes, oh, I have an appointment. I have to meet with people in violence today at nine o'clock. Isn't that amazing that he does that? I just think it's amazing. I mean, I can't, I can't even get my medical doctor to keep an appointment on time, let alone the God of the universe. And um, perhaps the people said amen to that. I, I don't know. <laughs> so I have this sheet that I'm supposed to follow and I can't to see where I'm supposed to be. Oh, here we go. <laughs> the purpose of gathering as God's people is, the, the singular purpose is that we would hear from our God. And so in this service, there's gonna be some things that God is gonna be doing. He's gonna be talking to us about his righteousness and about his love for us. The Holy Spirit is gonna be directing us and speaking to us. So I would love for you and for me and for us together to prepare our hearts to hear from this God who kept his appointment with us, nine o'clock, violent, South Jersey, Cumberland County. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Father, we acknowledge that if we don't have your words of life, we don't have life. Only you have the words of life. And we've gathered here to quiet our hearts and to allow your spirit to talk to us about whatever you want to say to us. And we thank you, God gather and we worship you. <laughs> Thank you for not being a God that vacations somewhere in the universe and I just get your voicemail. Thank you for being a God who, get, who, who responds to my prayer texts. When I call to you, you answer. Thank you. Speak to us today, Lord. We invite you to come, amp up our ability to hear, strengthen your voice in our ears, and give us ready hearts to say, yes, sir, because you are our God in your name, Lord. Amen. Good morning, church. You all awake? <laughs> I invite you to stand. whatever you're bringing into this service this morning, I want to tell you that Jesus is here to meet with you. His presence is here. Just want you to take a deep breath this morning. Breathe in his presence.
after day, day after day, night after night, I will remember you're with me in this fight. Although the battle it rages on, the war is already. the 
declare that you are exalted over all the trials and tribulations that face us, that you are to be exalted over every other one's opinion, everything that's happening in our culture, everything that's happening in our homes, everything that's happening in our finances. We want your leadership, and we, on our knees, acknowledge that you are the one who is worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy, worthy, worthy. <laughs> we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. stretch our capacity to wait in your presence and to allow you to say what you want to say. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for who you are. You may be seated if you're not already. You know, one of the things that we get to do um, in our relationship with God is we get to follow him in obedience and obedience opens doors a blessing it just simply does one of the ways you could do that is by following the Lord in baptism and we have um, a baptism course that's actually happening today two o'clock to four o'clock and then it's also happening on the 31st and so if you have not received uh, been baptized we want to encourage you to come and at least consider what's being taught there. And then we have something else that we are doing here that's, uh, we're doing it for November and also December. It's called Hearing God. And so if you were here last time, how many of you were at the Hearing God thing we did? Oh man, look at all the people. All right, we're hungry to hear you, God. So we want you to teach us more. And it's November 7th, six o'clock here. And then we'll also follow that up on December 5th. And then you have, if you haven't noticed yet, there's something we're doing here called Operation Christmas Child, and we have a video that we'd like to share with you. Hi, everybody. My name is Shuey, and I am an Operation Christmas Child shoebox. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about Operation Christmas Child. So Operation Christmas Child was founded by Franklin Graham in 1993. Its purpose is to demonstrate God's love in a tangible way to children in need all over the world. Now the first year, they packed 28,000 gift-filled shoe boxes for children in war-torn Bosnia. Since then, through your generosity and the generosity of millions of other people just like you, over 188 million shoe boxes have been sent to needy children in 170 countries. Let me tell you a little bit about what to pack in a shoe box. Here's a shoe box that Mrs. Shuey packed for a little girl. Now, the first thing that's important is when you get your shoe boxes, make sure that you get one of these brochures for each shoe box because it has the label on the back. And this is very important because it tells whether it's going to be packed for a boy or a girl and what the age group is. Now, there's a few nice things in here. Here's a little wow gift, a nice stuffed bunny, hair band, and some barrettes, a sewing kit for a young girl so she can practice her sewing. Hygiene items. You always want to pack some hygiene items. You can pack a toothbrush, or you can pack soap, washcloth, maybe a small towel, Play-Doh. Everybody likes Play-Doh. And uh, flip-flops. Who doesn't want flip-flops? I see uh, crayons, uh, coloring books. So there's a lot of other things in here, a lot of things you can pack in a shoebox. But if you want some other ideas, you can go online to uh, Samaritan's Purse, op uh, slash, front slash Operation Christmas Child, and you can learn what to pack, and more importantly, what not to pack. So um, let's see, a couple other options. A doll is always good, a nice doll, uh, something personal, a letter uh, uh, from you to a child, uh, a photo of your family. That's always a nice thing to put in there. Here's a soccer ball ready to go. Now, if you do pack a soccer ball, take all the air out of it and pack a pump in it so that they can fill it back up when they receive it. We talked about school supplies, clothing. We have clothing, we have socks. Uh, here's a T-shirt. Uh, you can pack pretty much anything that will fit in a shoebox. 
Tips for the older kids, which are nice, are solar flashlights, solar calculators. Now, I say solar because it's important. Uh, if you pack something that only works on batteries, make sure you pack some extra batteries so it doesn't die and be useless the first time that they use it. The most important thing that goes in a shoebox, and you don't actually see it, but that shoebox is filled with love. It's filled with your love. Uh, it's filled with God's love. Many children ha in the world have never received a gift. And the fact that someone cares enough to pack a shoebox and send it to them is, well, that's almost more important than the things that are in the shoebox. When they receive a shoebox at a distribution, they hear about the truth of the gospel. They're told uh, by their church leaders about the love of Jesus Christ and how they too can receive the greatest gift of all, eternity with the Father. They can also take part in a follow-up discipleship program called The Greatest Journey. I have another box to show you, and this is an empty box. This box represents a child who will not be receiving a gift from Operation Christmas Child this year because no one packed it. So if you can find it in your heart to pack just one more shoebox, wouldn't that be wonderful that a child will receive your gift-filled shoebox? Lastly, I want to close with a story. This is a very special story because it's about a child in a country on the equator, and it's very hot there all year round. Now, this child was at a distribution, and one of our volunteers from the United States was there to help out. And when she saw the child open his box, and he pulled out winter gloves, now remember, this is on the equator. It's hot all the time. And she was very upset as she saw him pull out these winter gloves. And he put them on his hands. But she, meanwhile, went to uh, one of the interpreters and said, I'd like to talk to that child because I feel sorry for him to receive these winter gloves. And as he was putting them on, she went over with the interpreter and she said, aren't you upset that all you received in your box, that the main thing you received was a pair of winter gloves, heavy gloves? And he said, oh, no. He said, you don't understand. You see, I'm the goalie on my soccer team. And now I have goalie gloves. So you see, God knew that that child needed goalie gloves. So that's pretty much it for me. Um, say, Angelo, hey. how do you think we did? Stewie, I think you did great. Oh, good. You know, one thing that I think everybody needs to know. Oh, what's that? Is the $9. Nine dollars. Yeah, I should have told them about that. So the the nine dollars is used for shipping. It's used for training pastors in other countries to to uh, to uh, teach the children about the gospel. It's it's used for um, uh, the processing center. It's used for a lot of different things. So it's not just nine dollars to ship a shoebox, which seems like a lot, but it is used for a lot of things. There's actually a display out in the lobby which tells you about the journey of a shoebox from the time you pack it until a child receives it. You ought to look at it. What else? Is that it? Oh, there's one more thing. Oh. Uh, November 14th. Oh, oh, that's very important. Yeah, yeah, November 14th. Tell them about it. Yeah, so November 14th is our drop-off date, uh, so we would like to collect all the boxes by then so that week, as distribution gets ready, we can drop it off to the drop site. That's great. Well, that's wonderful. Well, I think we pretty well covered it all, don't you? I think so. Okay, well, this is Shuey signing off and saying have a blessed week and we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Mrs. Shuey, would you come, please? <laughs> All right. <laughs> there you go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here on the mission aspect of uh, Living Faith Alliance Church, and I guess the pie isn't up there, but anyhow, you've been seeing the pie chart. Okay, there it is. So you see the pie chart uh, of all the different uh, missions that, that our church gives to, and I want to thank you and keep giving, not only giving your monies, but giving your prayers. And here I'll give you a little update on what's happening in Russia. This week we would like to remind you of the ministry we get to support in Russia. Our partners, Steve and Wendy, who were here in the summer, 
continue to make possible a way for women who are pregnant to find a safe and caring place where they can see their pregnancy to full term while receiving godly support and opportunities to hear the gospel. Um, praise God because the director of the maternity home has returned from her country to Russia to continue leading the ministry at the home and uh, the different connections of the people there, the girls, the women that she works with. Praise God because one of the women who benefited from the home ministry is now in her own home country and has reached back to Russia to talk to the, the ministry there. So she is continually getting support and, and being encouraged to live her faith there in her home country. Pray for wisdom as the director of the home determines who to serve and when to serve and how to serve. Pray that God will grow the seeds planted in the hearts of the women who have been served through the ministry at the maternity home. Pray for, my, for a migrant woman, woman who is five months pregnant. She has been very sick and hospitalized. And Lord, and we just thank you, Lord, that um, she is getting support from this home. And thank you for joining us in thanking God and asking for his favor over these precious lives. And uh, I'd like you to join me in prayer. Dear Father, you know um, the needs of all there who are working, all the team. It's not just Steve and Wendy, but there are a team of people working to love on those migrant workers, to show them God's love. Lord, we ask that you will just bless them. We give you the honor and the praise for their work there, and I know they do too. And we ask you to be with these different migrants, the women, uh, Lord, their children, all the difficulties that they come through. May they see your light, dear Jesus, the light of Christ. And may they know you as Lord of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You know, if you're uh, 17 years old or age or older, uh, there's a cross-cultural missions trip that we're talking about. If, you need to, if you're interested, please see Angelo or Greg. He'll give you some more information about it. I want to tell you a brief story, and then we're going to give to the Lord. I had a financial need that, uh, that was not anticipated in my coming here, and um, that financial need was weighing very heavily on my heart. I talked with Denise about it, and we were discussing it, and we were discussing where we were gonna put our faith. She went to the mailbox that day, and in the mailbox was an unexpected rebate for twice what we need for two months to meet this need. That is why I believe in engaging God on the adventure of giving, because he will prove himself. It's one of the many, one of the most important things. God said, test me in this and see if I will not. And I can tell you that as we give, we are, and if you'll show the slide, you guys know the drill. But as we give, if you will, it, it, if you will engage the adventure of giving, I promise you, both on my testimony and on the word of God, that you will discover things about the goodness and the faithfulness of God that you will never know unless you in, in, engage the adventure of giving. So, Father, we're going to give. And we thank you for giving to us first. In your name. All right, good morning, Living Faith. How's everyone doing? Good. I'm honored to bring the word to you this morning. Uh, so, let's start with the story, right? The year was 2000. I know what you're thinking. Y2K, oh my gosh, everything's gonna crash. All the computers malfunction, everything's gonna end. But congratulations, 21 years later, we made it. But no, if you could think back to that year of 2000, 
well, maybe some of you, because some of you weren't even born yet, but for others, maybe you can even think about what happened that year or what you were most worried about. For me, little Angelo was seven years old, and I was most worried about beating the Elite Four in Pokemon Gold. And so growing up with my dad, my dad was a chef, uh, my mom was kind of like the head waitress, and he owned a catering business called the Arlington Caterers. And uh, you know, before you're like, man, I am starting to feel real old, Angelo. Listen, we both had something in common. Child labor laws didn't seem to apply to us. Because I, from the earliest years I could remember, I was working with my dad. I mean, like, very early on. Jared, if you could bring up that slide of uh, just a picture of my, there you go. So if you could see little Angelo there eating his cookie and, uh, you know, stirring some sauces and things like that. You know, it was great being able to work at that young of an age, uh, you know, and I learned the value of hard work, but I also learned how to party. Because, man, the best part of being at a catering place was all the weddings and parties. And I'd be working in the kitchen, uh, seven years old, and then as soon as I'd get done with my work, I would sneak out, and I would go onto the dance floor, and I would, like, join all these random people and just be dancing away. And you're probably thinking, like, what? Like, what on earth? Like, why would you do that? Like, what are you thinking? Like, why didn't you just stay in the kitchen? Man, I was a kid. I did not care what people thought about me because I knew who my dad was. My dad owned the place and I belonged. And you know, you could see another picture up there of, uh, of a bunch of kids and this was at a Christmas event and Santa would come and it was a lot of fun. And you know, while all these kids were told by the teachers that they had to sit down and you know, be quiet and just enjoy their lunch, well, Little Angelo didn't really care about doing that because, well, I get to go wherever I want. So I'm walking around, I'm going into the kitchen, and I'm getting my friends some extra chicken fingers. I'm going to the bar, making myself a Shirley Temple. You know, like, and, you know, interestingly, none of my teachers, none of my, my uh, peers bothered saying anything or, you know, questioning because the reality was, like, I knew who my dad was. He owned the place, and I belonged. Now, unfortunately, the world today doesn't quite look like that for me. I don't have the privilege of walking into the center tin, and, uh, you know, anytime there's a wedding, and just busting a move onto the dance floor and expect everyone just to accept me. Or if I'm at a restaurant that I really enjoy, I can't just go behind the bar and make myself a Shirley Temple. No big deal. No, actually, most of the places that I've been in my adult life, my dad didn't own, and I heard the, the message loud and clear, you don't belong. Some of you might not be able to connect to my story when I was a kid, but I can tell you one thing that's true for everyone listening today, is that all of us at one time thought and lived like orphans and have been fathered by the devil. Let me say that again. All of us at one time thought and lived like orphans fathered by the devil. Everyone in this room at some point in life has had the feeling of, I don't belong here, I'm not important enough, and I don't feel safe here. Last week, Greg mentioned this point, which I believe is right on, that every kid is asking three questions Am I loved? Do I belong? Am I significant? Do I matter? Am I secure or safe? And then we were reminded that we've been forgiven. We've been connected through Jesus to the Most High God, and we're part of this new kingdom family. So here's my question for us this morning. Why do we still live and think like hell? Why do we still continue to live like, life like orphans? 
It's because for as long as we've lived in this broken world, there's a risk of us being fathered by the God of this world or of this age, like 2 Corinthians 4 says. The one who is blinding the eyes of non-believers from seeing the light of the gospel of Jesus. This father of lies, the devil. Now, you're probably wondering, what on earth are you talking about? I know God. I know the scriptures. God is my father, to which I'd say, I hope so. But anybody can pull the I know God card, just like the Pharisees did. I want to show you um, just a passage in John chapter 8, and you can read more of this later on your own. I'm going to start in verse 31 here to save some time. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, okay? They believed in him. And watch what he says to them. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many of us have heard that verse before, right? How many heard it like, um, if you know the truth, then the truth will set you free? But instead, that's not what Jesus is actually saying. He's saying, if you abide in my word, if you hold on to what I'm saying to you, then you will know the truth, and then the truth will set you free. And these Jews who are believing in him, who are listening to him, are like, what are you talking about? We're not enslaved. We're children of Abraham. And then Jesus says this, I know that you're offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I've seen from my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. And they're like, what, what are you talking about? Abraham's our father. And he's like, no, no. Actually, um, if, if that were true, you'd be doing the things Abraham did, but instead you do the things your father does. And they're like, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Um, God is our father, right? Ha we got you here. And he goes, no, actually, um, if that were true, you would love me because the father is the one who sent me. And now he says this, why don't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. All of us run the risk of having the words of Jesus find no place in our hearts. At some point in your life, Maybe even right now, you are of your father, the devil, and the things that he desires. And it, do you know what the father of lies desires is for your life? To kill, steal, and destroy everything in your life that God wants you to have the abundant life. He wants you to be unforgiving, bitter, angry, afraid, anxious, depressed, suicidal. Why? Because that's all the things that he is because he is already defeated. But he wants to convince you that you're defeated too. He wants you, he wants you to think that you're just like him. And some of you have spent a lot of time being fathered by him and living and thinking like an orphan. Maybe some of you in this room would say, your father is the heavenly father, but the truth is there's still some things in you and how you've been previously parented by this devil that needs to come out. So what hope is there for us? How can we be set free from the parental influence of the devil himself? I can tell you another thing. That's true for everyone listening today. And it's that lavishing us with marvelous love, God the Father calls us his very own children and is reparenting us to be like, look like, and act like his son Jesus. I, I don't know if I, I, I heard you loud enough. 
lavishing us with marvelous love, God the Father calls us his very own children and is reparenting us to be like, look like, and act like Jesus. That's right, every sin pattern and influence coming into our lives from the devil, Jesus came to undo, destroy, and overturn. At one time, we were just like our daddy, the devil. But Jesus came onto the scene. While we were still living like orphans, he came. While we were enemies of God, Jesus died for us. When we were lost, he came. 2 Corinthians says this, For God made the only one, Jesus, who did not know sin, to become sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. Did you ever think about that verse before? Jesus became sin. Perfect, holy, sinless Jesus became sin on that tree, on that cross. Let me just change that passage around for you a bit. Jesus became lawlessness so that we would become law keepers. Jesus became murder and hatred so that we would become lovers. Jesus became a liar so that we would become truth tellers. Jesus became impure so that we would become pure. He became abandoned so that we'd always be with the Father. Jesus became lust so that we would be filled with righteous desires. Jesus became racism so that we would become unity in diversity. Jesus became sin on that tree, rewriting everything as if sin was never taken off the tree so that we would become the righteousness of God. Today, the Holy Spirit is going to be setting you free from sin patterns and places where you have felt stuck. He's going to open your ears to be able to hear the Father's voice. He's going to remove that orphan spirit that still clings on to you today. And I'm going to give you space later in service to respond. But I want to pray for us as we go into the rest of this message. So, Father, I thank you that you've sent Jesus to become sin for us so that we would become the righteousness of God. And that you have implanted your Holy Spirit in us as a sign of who we are, sons and daughters of you. So I thank you that you're going to speak to us today, right now, and it's going to change our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we get into 1 John today, I want to show you three goals the, parent, the father has when it comes to reparenting you. These three goals are all over the text. However, as we read the text today, I believe we won't be able to receive the full revelation of what Holy Spirit wants to teach us through John if we don't change one thing first. We need to receive like a child. You see... John is constantly saying things like, little children. And as adults, we basically say, oh, that's cute, and then move right along. But I think there's a significant message in here for us if we actually were to receive this message as a little child. So I'm going to help rewire your brain so that you can actually start thinking like a kid again. Okay. Now, I'm not going to share more stories about me playing Pokemon or maybe invoke some of your old childhood memories by bringing up toys on screen. I'm just simply going to bring us back to our ABCs and 1, 2, 3s of 1 John. Right? So, imagine yourself in first grade. Learning a new language requires humility. Proud people don't do well learning a language because they suck at messing up and failing. Because they're so worried about what other people have to say about them or think about them that they refuse to learn through the uncomfortable many failures. Kids, on the other hand, they learn languages so well because they soak up information like a sponge 
And the other thing is they're constantly failing learning in life anyway, so who cares? They're just trying to get better. And that is my call for us today. Can we learn the language of Holy Spirit today? Can we learn what the Father is trying to say to us? And his goal of the ABCs and one, two, threes of being reparented. So here's what we got. A, abide in him. B, before he appears. C, confidence, not shame. One, children of God, be like Jesus. Two, reflections of God, look like Jesus. Three, operatives of God, act like Jesus. So as we read 1 John uh, 2, 28 into 3, verse 10 together, I want you to look for these ABCs and 1, 2, 3s with me. Thankfully, I helpfully co color coordinated them for you. But let's read this together. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we might have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. And see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we will know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Everyone who practices or makes a practice of sinning is also practicing lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there's no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Who, who do, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So let's start with A, abide in him. The word abide appears eight times in the second chapter. It means fellowship, which Fellowship actually shows up four times in the first chapter. It's this key to the first two chapters. And I want you to see verse 28 here as like this bridge from one emphasis into the next. John is concluding this message of abiding and moving into divine sonship or daughtership. I think daughtership should be a word if it's not already a word. But John was emphasizing in these first two chapters, the contrast between light and darkness, love and hatred, truth and error. And he made this strong stance. Any of these sins of being disobedient, which would be walking in the dark while claiming the light, being hateful or untruthful is evidence of not abiding in God. But he also made this other strong stance. If you confess your sins, the Father is faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Fellowship with others and God. So let me ask you something. If God cleanses you from all unrighteousness, what's left? Righteousness. Because we have become the righteousness of God. And then the very next thing John says is, if you sin... Not when you sin, if you sin. What? Is John saying that you can live a life free from sin in righteousness as we abide in Jesus and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit? Yes. Do Christians still have the ability to sin? Yes. But we are no longer characterized by our sin. 
And it's definitely not in our desire when we know the Father. We'll get more into that later. If you do sin, we have an advocate, Jesus the righteous. And he's bringing us back to a place of abiding with God. This is it right here. This is where you were made to be. Abiding with God. It's everywhere. Look at the life of Jesus. So John is now moving from abiding into this next emphasis, sonship or being born of God. So B, before he appears, how long do we have to abide in him? As long as it takes until we are home with the Father or when Jesus appears. One of the things I love about our denomination is these symbols that you can see as you walk right into the lobby it's that this fourfold gospel that we believe it's central to who we are, that Jesus is our savior, our sanctifier, our healer, and our coming king. The yellow there is a little messed up. But our coming king, that's what I'm talking about right now. We just read a statement together a few weeks back that said this. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is imminent, meaning surprise, surprise. Except, you know, we don't actually know what it is, but it's going to happen, and it's going to come soon. And it will be personal, visible, and premillennial. That last one's a little debated. This is the believer's blessed hope, and it's a vital truth in which it's an incentive to holy living and faithful service. The reality of Jesus' return is to be our incentive to holy living and faithful service. We want to abide because Jesus is coming. We need to prepare ourselves. And knowing this, we are to have confidence, not shame. As we abide in him before he returns, we are in this joy of living in right relationship with God. Revelations 19 even talks about this moment of the bride and the groom coming together. And this bride, the church, she is beautiful. And you know what it says? She made herself ready. That means that Jesus isn't coming back for a sick, mangled up, desperate harlot. He's coming back for a beautiful, pure bride. And as we prepare, we take joy in this fact that we have a God who's on his way to restore this world. Therefore, we can have confidence when he appears because we have lived rightly and served him, following him however he leads us. And for what reason would we feel like we need to shrink back and hide in shame? Well, I want you to think about this in the context of relationship. For those of you with a dog... You know how maybe they're so filled with joy and they're so happy to see you the moment that you walk through the door, right? Every single day, it's like, oh, you're home. Oh my God, I've waited for hours and it's been five minutes. But like, you know, when they don't come to the door and greet you, they did something wrong. Like, you know they got into something or that your couch is currently in pieces, right? And so I think the, the shame that John is talking about here is, is not like that, that we didn't know him because John is talking to believers. This shame he's talking about is to those who are going to feel the weight of the reality of what? He's that good? He's this worthy? And I could have given him more glory in this life? I could have lived more of an empowered life and looked like that, but I just decided to coast through life and sit in my pew and continue struggling with sin because I'm a sinner saved by grace. No, Jesus is coming back for this beautiful, pure bride, and he wants that to be you. So that's our ABCs, and as we know our ABCs, then we start to get into our one, two, threes. And so, firstly, children of God, be like Jesus. Do you know one of the things I hear a lot around here at Living Faith? 
I hear lots of stories about God setting you free from certain sin patterns or saving your marriage or just how you're currently in this state of acknowledging your sin and brokenness before God. But if I said what was true about John earlier saying that God cleanses us from all unrighteousness, then I believe the Lord wants to teach us how to embrace what being sons and daughters of the Most High God look like. I hear lots of, I'm such a sinner saved by grace, but I, I believe the Lord wants to increase among us saints who hear his voice that do what the Father is doing, and they know their place as sons and daughters. I mean, look at what John is saying in this verse one. I like it in the Passion Translation. Look with wonder at the depth of the Father's marvelous love that he has lavished on us. And he has called us and made us his very own beloved children. The term lavished in the Greek is this term used to tell of something that came outside the country. It's so exotic. It's so extravagant. It's never seen before. It's this amazing love that defines your value. And in him choosing you, there's nothing else that seems to matter. You've been born again. And this emphasis on the, world, on the word children is like God begot you. Later in the passage, you'll see God says God's seed is in you. That same word for seed is what we use for sperm. It's as if the father is trying to say, hey son, hey daughter, just took a DNA test. Turns out you 100% belong to me. I love this quote from, from Brenning Manning in Abba's Child, which I highly recommend you read. And it says this, many Christians find themselves defeated by the most psychological weapon that Satan uses against them. Its name, low self-esteem. Our old dad, Satan, continues to try to parent us to be like him. Lie to us, use every kind of weapon to divert our attention away from the truth that we are image bearers, just like he did with Adam and Eve. Now, even more so than in the garden, because we are this new creation. The word new creation means like prototype, never before existed. Solomon says there's nothing new under the sun, except he's never seen us yet, because we are brand, brand new. And so we've been set free, divinely connected to the Father, and because of the Son and have the, spell, the Spirit dwelling in us and empowering us to live righteously with God every day. I want you to hear Romans 8 like you're hearing it for the first time. Maybe you want to close your eyes. Whatever you got to do. Ready? The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit and you did not receive the spirit of religious duty leading you back into the fear of never being good enough. But you have received the spirit of full acceptance, enfolding you into the family of God, and you will never feel orphaned. For as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, Beloved Father, Abba, Daddy, for the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers into our innermost being, you are God's beloved child. It's in abiding in this reality that we are indeed God's children. And then we start to love ourselves because God loves us. Do you remember that flower when you were a kid of he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not, there is no loves me not on that thing. It's just he loves me, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. And when we are consumed by this love and we can actually learn to love how he made us, we begin to love our neighbor as ourselves, like Jesus said. And we're able to actually embody his character, being partakers of this divine nature it's the noblest aspiration. It's the most demanding task of your life is to become like Jesus. That's a good word right there, Angelo. But I know you think that's awesome, but just you wait. 
reflections of God look like Jesus. The message said this, that this is the only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we'll see him, and in seeing him, become like him. All of us who look forward to his coming stay ready with the glistening purity of Jesus' life as our model for our own. In seeing him, we become like him. The other day in a prayer time, not to call her out, but Dara, I heard her pray this, Lord, you are the sun and we are the moon. We have no light of our own. But it's when we turn our face to you, we reflect you. I think that pretty much sums up what God is up to here. Abiding in him, spending time with Abba, we actually turn our face and behold him, and when we behold him, we become like him and we reflect him. The word made clear means to shine. So we're children of God, but we're also reflections of God, and Daniel prophesied what we'd be like when he said this, those who are wise will shine as brightly as the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever. We who are righteous, leading others to righteousness, shine, reflecting the light of Jesus, and soon we shine as brightly as Jesus. Quickly, I want to tell you a story that changed the way I thought about things, and you're probably going to be like, this is a weird story, but this is Jacob with Laban's flock in Genesis 30. Now, to recap, Jacob's basically been working for Laban, and, you know, he gets his wives, he gets his children, and he's ready to go back to his own country, and after working for him so long, he's, he's made Laban really wealthy, but now it's time to go and build up his own. And so he made this deal with him that from the flock of sheep and goats, Jacob was only to take the speckled and spotted and black ones, and then Laban would keep all the white ones. So then Laban agreed, but then kind of like he took, he stole all of the, the black spotted and all the ones, and he brought them three days away to his other sons, just leaving Jacob with the white ones. And Jacob's like, okay, well, I'll come up with my own idea. So while he was tending the flock, he, like, he had these sticks, and he was carving in these sticks stripes and spots. And basically, when they got down to the watering hole, which is where the flock would mate, he would put these sticks up or take them away. If they were strong and he saw them mating, he would put these sticks up in front of them. If they were weak, he would take the sticks away. You're probably thinking, that's just weird. But what's up happening is that these strong ones, as they're by the watering hole and they're seeing these sticks, they're beholding it with their eyes and it's on the center of their mind. And so they actually begin to reproduce what they're beholding. And so Jacob actually completely flips the flock and takes all of the strong ones that were black, spotted, and speckled just because he did this method. And you're like, what, what is going on? My point is to say that we become what we behold. We actually reproduce what we behold at the watering hole of our imagination. Let me say that again. We reproduce what we behold at the watering hole of our imagination, meaning I'm talking to those in the room who've said this out loud or have thought this, I will never ever become like my mom or my dad. Or I will, I will not be like this person who hurt me in my life. But guess what? If that's on the front of your mind and that's what you're constantly thinking about, that's actually what you begin to reproduce in your life. And so Jesus is saying, actually, if you behold me, you'll start to reproduce what I look like. And so you may have gotten hurt from your parents. You, you may be mad because at like your earthly fathers or mothers blaming your parents for the ways they did or didn't parent you. But ultimately, this is going to kill you and let your past determine your future. And Jesus is here to break that cycle. 
And if you've gotten hurt by your father who wasn't following Jesus and maybe just sprinkled Jesus into the mix of your life but wasn't actually submitted to Jesus, then he didn't know what submission was or maybe that Jesus was Lord. And so therefore, you got hurt by what wasn't submitted to God. So you got hurt by the devil. Because the devil's goal is to influence every single person to be like him because our war is not against flesh and blood our war is actually against powers and principalities and demonic strongholds and dark spirits in the heavenly places the devil's scheming and he's influencing all these ways in life that are it's like a battle over the hearts of human beings so that he could steal kill and destroy in your life but we need to ignore the stranger's voice and we need to know our father's voice, the father in heaven who loves us, who speaks to us, who cares for us. And if we don't have consistent, constant time with Abba and behold Jesus, then we're just gonna continue to get fathered by life, fathered by the devil. So as we reflect him and we become like Jesus, we then actually are like a light in the darkness, becoming number three, operatives of God acting like Jesus. An operative is a person engaged, employed, or skilled in some branch of work. So I'm talking to those in the room who've been disengaged, spiritually unemployed, or unskilled in the work of advancing the kingdom of God into enemy territory. God is awakening you into a brand new way of living. John is making this ethical argument here. He's saying that the children of God and the children of the devil, they're recognized by their deeds. After just dismantling these antichrists, false teachers, the people are probably asking, well, then how do we know who to trust? And John's answer is simply this, look at the fruit. Children of God live righteously and they sanctify themselves and they don't persist in a lifestyle of sin. Okay? This is what John's actually talking about when he says practicing sin, not just instance, actual pattern, lifestyle. But the children of devil, however, don't know God. They don't love others. They're lawless and they're controlled by their sinful nature. So who's your daddy? Who are you going to act like? John's call for us is be righteous, and in him, we're to be pure like him. So what other things does Jesus specifically do that we can walk in? Jesus brought sins to the cross, and he destroyed the works of the devil. Jesus came to eradicate sin on the cross, and there's still this eradication process happening sanctification, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, that needs to take place. And so what other thing can we do is through forgiveness, through repentance, through reconciliation, through loving others who sin against us, we continue to bring sin to the cross. And then secondly, we are to live a life of destroying the work of the devil. I remember getting hired here. I went through a crazy season of my life where I had just broken off an engagement because she had cheated on me, and I was like at the end of myself. And I remember being on my knees and saying, God, Satan used my fiance as a weapon against me, so get me a job here and I'll destroy hell for a living. And then two days later, I get a job description from Greg. That's how I started working here. Like, this is a lifestyle that we get to live in, where this word destroy doesn't mean annihilate, but rather to break down, to undo, to render ineffective. In other words, the works of the devil have been deprived of force, rendered inoperative, conquered, and overthrown. This means that any power that we see demonstrated from the devil in our lives, either it comes from outside of us because he's still ruling over this world as the God of this world, or because we've been, 
We've transferred our authority and power over to him by believing lies. Because when we believe lies, we empower the liar. Your faith is like this connector. It's like basically plugging into a source and then receiving power from it. And so either we're plugging into the source of sin and the kingdom of darkness, or we're plugging into life and the kingdom of heaven. And so which are you going to plug your faith into today? You see, I want us to think about the prayer Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the will of the Father is for earth to look like heaven, right? But how can earth look like heaven if we allow the Father of this world to rule our life? And you know, the other thing is, too, that I hear a lot from some Christians is that basically everything that happens in life, it's just God's will. And that is wrong. It's wrong to look a mother in the eyes who just had a miscarriage and say, well, it's just the will of God. Oh, or being at a funeral and hearing a priest or whoever say, the Lord gives and he taketh away. Really? Really? Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy, and there's things in this world that are not according to God's will, but we are to step into what he's calling us to be like his son and to say, no, devil, you will not have place here. You know, I, I hate, have you seen those pictures like on Facebook, like where you got like Satan versus like God, Right? If you, like, post those on Facebook, please stop. It is not even a contest. You can't even fit God in that picture because he's infinite. Like, Satan is like, we're going to get to heaven and be like, what? It was you that did all this? It was you? Are you kidding me? The devil is nothing compared to God. And yet Jesus now calls us as sons and daughters to come into the heavenly place and says, you get to crush the head of Satan under your feet because you're with me. And just like I had the confidence when I was a kid walking around being like, I don't care, my dad owns the place and I belong. Every place we walk into because we are the light, we get to say, Jesus now owns this place, and in him I belong. I want to just say one more thing of being operatives of God is a lifestyle on the offense. It's advancing the kingdom. Jesus said in Mark 16, these signs will follow believers. They'll cast out devils, and they'll lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. I read that and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm a believer. Does that mean I get to do it too? Yes. We get to do the things Jesus did, greater things, but it demands that we pick a side. We can't live out of two kingdoms. We we can't serve two gods. There's a story of this atheist having a dream, and in this dream, this man seeing, uh, he's standing on a fence, And he sees on one side a man who resembles Jesus, and there's few people with him. And on the other, there's this really attractive man who who has this allure about him. And you know what? He doesn't have red skin, horns, or a pitchfork, but he knows he's the devil. And there's millions and millions and millions of people with him. And so he's standing on the fence, looking at both sides, and then suddenly everyone disappears. And then he sees the devil approach him, says, there you are, I've been looking for you. And the man says, I, what are you doing here? I didn't choose you. And he goes, well, actually, the fence belongs to me. We are to choose a side today. I want to summarize. All of us at one time thought and lived like orphans, fathered by the devil. So what hope is there for us? 
How can we be set free from the parental influence of the devil himself? Lavishing us with marvelous love, God the Father calls us his very own children and is reparenting us to be like, look like, and act like his son, Jesus. We're learning the ABCs and one, two, threes of First John, of abiding in him before he appears confidence, not shame, and one, children of God, be like Jesus, reflections of God, look like Jesus, operatives of God, act like Jesus. So today, will you renounce any allegiance to the Father of lies and submit yourselves to God the Father? If today something resonated in you about what I've shared, or maybe there's lies you're believing, maybe there's still some sins that you need to confess and actually turn away from as hard as that might be, maybe it's some level of demonic oppression you've been experiencing. We're gonna have some ministry time. I know we've kind of running up to the end of service here. Um, but I wanna invite anybody from our prayer ministry up uh, to just come stand at the front. And would you stand with me as we just receive time just in the Lord's presence and just listen to what Holy Spirit has to say to us. So don't leave today without getting free. Don't leave today without receiving the love of the Father. If you need prayer, come up. Or if you feel like maybe you just want to raise your hand and um, we'll, ha we'll move towards you. But the Holy Spirit is speaking to us right now. me through this process sorry about that when the father started taking me through this process uh, based on the fact that you shall know the truth and the truth sets you free one of the things I learned is that lies keep you bound and so in renouncing the father of lies we are also following the scripture that says resist the devil submit yourself to God we're saying God I want you to teach me what truth is Show me where the lies are so I can renounce them one by one as you lead me and we can, and we can move together. I love the message that, that Angelo brought for us today. So Father, as we sit in your presence, stand in your presence, sit in your presence, sit at home listening to this message later on or now, we renounce the father of lies. We renounce the things that he's placed in our lives that we can't even see that you have yet to reveal. But we draw the line in the sand and say we will not be people led by the father of lies. We will come and we will put our faith, our trust, and our obedience in the father of truth and the father of light so that we can have confidence at the day of your appearing because we know we're walking toward you and in you and, and we're allowing your righteousness to just continue to bear fruit in our lives. Father, we ask that you would help those who want to stay for prayer and you will continue to speak to those who feel they must leave. Father, that you will have your lordship expressed not only um, in, in the past of moment where we accepted you, but in the living of we, that we do today and in the coming of your appearance uh, in every aspect of our lives, we ask, Lord, in your name. Amen. We invite you for prayer. God bless you if you need to leave or if you want to sit and be prayed for by one another. Uh, we encourage you to take this step of making this renouncing and step into the kingdom fully and completely. God bless you.
Jesus, Alpha. Alpha. 